This is the Mazda RX-8 rotary powered rocket. Specifically, my Mazda RX-8. This car is everything you might want in a sports car. It's fast-ish. I've taken it to autocross events and it handles extremely well and it can certainly hold its own. Woo! Skid the whole way! Alright, bust the move! Alright, through the gate! Oh, he just ran over one. <laughs> but I love this car the best when I'm using it as a grand tour. For instance, I took a two week long drive from Texas all the way to Washington and I visited national parks, Big Bend, Colorado National Monument, Yellowstone. I visited the Bonneville Salt Flats and slung myself at ridiculous speeds. I visited deserts, I visited mountains, plains, all sorts of weird and wonderful terrain. I went up and down a mining road. I went up and down desolate roads in Utah at the speed limit. And you know what? At the end of the two weeks, even though my back was a little sore, I was still having just as much fun getting to places as I was visiting the places. And perhaps best of all, this car has a fantastic community. All this made me all the more sad when my car started exhibiting the telltale signs of a worn out engine. Misfires, loss of power, and generally a loss of that 9000 RPM magic that makes this car so special. So, of course, I checked all the small things like spark plugs and coils. All of those are fine. Unfortunately, this points to a more serious engine problem, so I decided to run a compression test to see what I was up against. Easy enough, right? Just get your old compression tester, just a couple bucks at your local auto parts store, plug this in, crank the engine, and read your fate on here. Well, hold on there, cowboy, because... As with many things with rotary engines, things aren't always as simple as they seem. Now, in a regular piston engine, each spark plug hole corresponds to one sealing surface. So you've got a cylinder with a piston in it, there's piston rings providing the seal between the piston and the block, and if you put this in the spark plug hole, you're reading the, uh, the health of just that seal. Now. If we look over to my keychain here, which has a convenient model of a rotary engine, the spark plug holes are in the side, um, and the spark plug holes correspond to a total of three seals. So if you imagine the little spark plugs sitting, uh, this is kind of broken, um, sitting over here, if you read the pressure now, you're checking this seal and this seal. But if you rotate it further, say to there, you're now checking this seal and this seal. So if you were to use something like this, you would get the reading corresponding to the best two seals that you have. Uh, because this thing uh, remembers the greatest pressure when you hit this to release the pressure. So unfortunately, if you use this, you might get a very, very false picture of what's going on in your engine. Because, say, if this seal is completely gone, you might still be reading nope, you might still be reading a good uh, pressure because these two seals are actually building up a reasonable amount of pressure. So here's how I'm going to do it. I could just go to the dealership and get it read, but uh, you know, figured I'd try it myself. Uh, just because I like doing this kind of stuff. What this is, is a capacitive pressure transducer. Um, and basically what it does is it takes your pressure reading and transforms it into a 4 to 20 milliamp current at the output. Um, and this one happens to be, okay, so from 0 to 250 psi. So it is enough to deal with the pressures in a non-running engine. So through a couple adapters, that I had to order from eBay and things like that. This is a swage lock to a NPT. This is NPT to whatever the heck these are called. I always forget. Through this sort of sequence of adapters, I can finally go and uh, connect this to my car. So I will be doing that in a minute. But first, a little bit on how to use these devices. Okay, it's worth discussing for a minute why I chose a capacitive sensor versus some of these other types. Now, this table is part of Cetra's um, handbook for 
uh, pressure transducer types so they're trying to sell their um, their wares here so keep that in mind but um, the general uh, information in this table is, is pretty much correct as far as I can tell so two things stood out uh, one is media compatibility so basically um, does the sensor care if you put weird stuff in it so for instance gasoline vapors which might certainly happen in this application uh, this uh, transducer type does not care it has a high compatibility with different types of media um, so that is, is a good thing uh, the other thing is frequency response so this thing is listed as having a fast frequency response which is good because this engine even though it's being cranked by the starter will be spinning pretty fast and the pressure peaks will be fairly short um, so it is helpful to have a fast frequency response uh, now I don't have the actual data telling me exactly how fast a fast frequency response is but I'm just gonna hope that it's fast enough <laughs> engineering <clears throat> anyways Yep, that's what I'm going to be testing. Now, of course, that's only half of the equation. How am I going to replace this? Because clearly, I can't connect this to that pressure transducer, and even if I did, I wouldn't be able to read off the, the peaks and the pressure anyways. Well, the solution is this. My trusty digital storage oscilloscope. Yes, it is digital storage, even though it is very old. But um, I can activate this button here, and... There you go, digital storage scope, even though it is an analog display. So, hook this up, and uh, set myself up a trigger, and I will be able to read off each face of the rotor right on here, and I will also be able to calculate the RPM of the engine by looking at, you know, where the peaks are, which is very important for rotary engines, because if you look at uh, the Mazda specifications, the compression, the acceptable compression readings um, are given in a table where one column is RPM and the other one is acceptable pressure uh, reading. So if your engine is spinning faster, it'll actually develop more compression. Um, so if you get a really low compression at low RPMs, it's not necessarily a cause for concern. So that is very helpful. And this is why um, the compression testers for, for these cars tend to be expensive because they have to have uh, um, some intelligence inside of them to read off the pressure and you know pr provide three uh, readings per face. Oh, sorry, three readings per um, per rotor. So there you go. Okay. So let's look at how this thing is actually used. So as you can see here, it has an excitation voltage of 24 volts. And if you actually read the data sheet, it has a range of about um, maybe 16 to 30 volts that it, this thing can accept. But it was factory calibrated at 24 volts. And the output is uh, a linear. Um, output from 4 to 20 milliamps. So 4 milliamps signifies 0 PSI and 20 milliamps corresponds to 250 PSI gauge. That's important. So you might have two questions right about now. One, current output. That's kind of weird. Why not just have voltage output? The other question is, okay, current output, but how do I read such a thing? Well, Let's talk about the problems and benefits of a voltage output transducer, not like the one I have, like other kinds. Well, the way you use those is pretty simple. You have your transducer, you supply it with some power, here it's 24 volts, and you get a voltage output here that is uh, proportional to the pressure that this thing is seeing. And then you have some wires and some sort of meter. And uh, this works fine. It's uh, you know fairly easy to use. Um, but it has a few limitations. One, if your wires here connecting the transducer to the meter are long, then you might actually encounter some voltage drop in the actual wires themselves, um, and that will throw off your reading. That's not something that you really want. The other problem is um, the, the voltage signal is actually susceptible to um, interference from say motors or other things like that so this thing you know if you have it next to this giant motor this thing might fluctuate a little bit because of that so what people do to remedy some of these problems is they go to a current output configuration and the setup is simple you just have your transducer here connected to a power supply and this thing will just kick out 
a particular current for the pressure it's seeing. Well, how do you read it? Well, there's many ways of doing it, but the basic idea is you just stick a resistor um, across the uh, sign series with the transducer. And, uh, you know, you use Ohm's law and you figure out the um, voltage drop that would correspond to a voltage drop across the resistor that would correspond to a particular current put out by this transducer, and there you go. You can do some math and figure out the pressure that this thing is seeing. Uh, the benefits of this, well, if you put your um, shunt resistor, as it's called, uh, at the end of your very long cable run, well, it won't even care because there may be some voltage drop in these long cables, but the transducer doesn't care. It's doing constant current, so it'll just bump up the voltage a little bit uh, to compensate for the uh, long cable run, and the reading will remain exactly the same. Likewise, the current signal is a bit more robust against uh, forms of inter interference. So if you're doing this in a factory setting, well, there you go. You have a much more robust system. Now, as for me, I don't actually care. You know, uh, I, Honestly, I would have preferred this setup here because it's a bit easier for me to use. I don't have to go dig out a resistor and do some extra bit of math. But hey, you know, I found this on eBay for a very good price, so I just went for it. Okay, here's the circuit kind of mocked up on a terminal strip. I've got the transducer connected there. I've got the shunt resistor. I've got my scope probe hooked up across the resistor. Uh, it's currently being powered by my bench supply. And if you look, turn on the supply. A uh, bit of a peak there, but uh, it's jumped up to around one volt. Um, and it seems to be working fine because if I blow into the transducer, see if I can do this while well, still pointing the camera at the scope. If I blow into the transducer, it'll move. Maybe you saw that. Anyways, this is a 250 PSI transducer, so there's only so much a human can do. But anyways, it seems to work, so uh, I will package this up and uh, bring it downstairs. Okay. Oh, and for those of you preferring a multimeter-based approach, I have just put my multimeter in series with the uh, transducer and the resistor, although it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, and we're reading eh, that much milliamps, which kind of surprised me because I thought zero would uh, be four milliamps. It's a bit high, but uh, anyways, if I blow into it quite hard, you can see that it goes up. So I think we're good to go. I just noticed how uh, neat this connector is. So it's a you know a lockable type. These are the tabs that you squeeze to release it. If it's been pulled and you pull these, you see that it's not actually releasing. So uh, that's a nice feature, unless you really mess with it. If you push this in, and then do that, the uh, little things lock open, and then it just pulls out easily. So you don't have to have this weird squeeze and pull, which is quite annoying in tight spaces. Well, I seem to have run into a slight problem. See that number? That's measuring the same thing, and they don't agree. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think this scope is due for a um, recalibration. What do you say? Well, what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a reading with this, take this back upstairs where I have a nice, accurate power supply, and just recreate the readings that I get from here and see what the actual voltage is. Just okay, just as a test. Let's use this, see what happens. All right, high tech capture system. Take two, I forgot to unscrew the little uh, check valve that was sitting in there. Try that again. Half volt per division, 0.1 seconds per division.
Rear rotor, half a volt per division, 0.1 seconds per division. So I've gone ahead and recreated the various readings I was getting on this scope and then adjusted my power supply with its oops, many uh, digits of precision and uh, I calibrated the readings. So let's see what kind of pressure my RX-8 can make. Well I was just doing some messing around and uh, the quiescent current of this thing seems to have dropped significantly. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here. It's very strange. I rechecked the calibration of this meter and it's bang on. So I don't know what's going on here. It seems sensitive to... to some pressure along this axis, which is slightly worrisome. So I'm pushing down and it goes... It doesn't change much, but if I pull, it drops quite a bit. I'm not sure what's going on here, to be honest. Hmm. Okay, so I've puzzled out some of the math. Um, what I'm getting is about 260 RPM, and uh, really bad numbers for the compression, about 60 PSI on each rotor. That's uh, kind of bad. If we take a look over here at the official Mazda chart, uh, you can see that um, pressure is the vertical axis. The second number here is the number in PSI. And yeah, cranking speed is on the x-axis. Line B is the minimum acceptable compression. Line A is the normal. Uh, so if you look over around here-ish for 260 RPM, the minimum acceptable is, oh, I don't know, right around 100 PSI. Uh, and normal is way up there, just below, say, uh, 145. So, unfortunately, this isn't looking good at all. Now, you might be thinking, well, remember those uh, readings that you got from just the gauge, the regular cheapo gauge? That was around, what, 100? About 90 or 100? Well, two, two things there. One, that's still not, or maybe just barely acceptable at 250 RPM, so the engine's bad anyways. But um, if you look very carefully at the video, which is terrible, I do apologize for that, I didn't realize that uh, the glare was playing up, but anyways, you, you see that the needle goes a little bit and then goes further, so it wasn't building up full pressure um, the first time around, so uh, I don't know, it's uh, still not good. In any case, the real point of the um, uh, pressure transducer is to see how consistent the readings are. And as you can see, all the seals are performing pretty much identically. Um, so, you know, using a regular uh, pressure uh, compression tester is probably fairly close. So while my absolute pressures might be way off with this meter, or sorry, with this transducer, who knows what it's been through, I guess. It's a bit too bad, but um, at least I can be fairly confident in the, um, the old school um, gauge that I was using there. And like I said, even that one was telling me that my engine was bad. So there's not much hope. Oh well, I guess it's time to uh, get a nice new engine and maybe turbo it. Hmm, let's see. Well, I guess I'll have to come to terms with the fact that uh, my poor rotary is sealing about as well as this keychain is. But uh, oh well, at least I know for sure now. I probably messed up some math somewhere, so if you see a problem, please let me know in the comments. Anyways, I'll catch you next time.